Welcome back everybody, this is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888, and today we've got another five guns video for you, but uh, this is a little bit different than what you probably used to see, and we're going to talk about the top five, uh, what we, who we feel are the most influential and important firearms engineers slash inventors uh, in history, and I've got a special guest with me today, this is Remington Little. Uh, he hey is in school for engineering, and he's also an apprentice over at Ruger, doing some great work over there. And uh, he's a friend of the channels. He likes to come hang out and do some filming and shooting with us. So you'll be seeing Remington uh, in some videos, and uh, we're going to kind of go down the list. And we figured Sounds good to me. this would be a great thing to have you in on since you're you're in school for engineering right. and you have an engineer's mind and you really you know like firearms a lot. So this is Love the, them. this is the perfect <laughs> list for you. Sounds All right, good. so um, we're going to kind of go down the line. Now, guys, let me just let me just provide a caveat here, okay? This was a very difficult list to come up with because this could have easily been a top 10 because there's been so many influential men and women uh, over the years that have had so much to do with the firearms technology that we hold near and dear to this day. And uh, people not only in the United States but from all around the world, uh, there's been very talented and very genius people all around the world that have been very directly responsible for the firearms that you know and love today. Uh, whether it's military weapons seen on the battlefield or your favorite sporter uh, gun, um, all of those technologies have to come from somewhere. And um, without getting into too much length in this video, we're going to go through some pretty uh, interesting ones. So we're going to go sort of chronologically. We're going to start out with Benjamin Tyler Henry, Samuel Colt, and Richard Gatling. Those are three guys that we felt needed to just be in that one spot. Right. They were all around in the same time area. It all sort of like meshed together with the technology being advancing with manufacturing of metals of a consistent density and all of that jazz. It really Absolutely. allowed for a great development in the reputability of firearms. That's right. So not only interchangeable parts, that would have been yep. a, a pretty important thing, but also the big thing with some somebody like Samuel Colt is he provided a, like with the single action army, he provided a gun that could be reliable, consistent, you could load it, shoot it, um, you know, it, it was a repeater, so you had more than one shot. It wasn't like a front stuffing, uh, muzzle loading pistol or anything like that, or a single shot pistol. It provided uh, repeatability, you know, uh, follow up shots, which is really important. Um, good quality manufacturing, parts interchangeability. Um, and really, he had a really genius way of marketing his. Uh, invention as well. So it, it became a household name. You know, everybody, militaries wanted uh, the Colt single action army. Of course, the military, Navy, uh, various aspects, army, Navy, you name it, uh, that we had then all relied on uh, Colt's single action repeater. Um, and it was just a, a pretty next level thing back then, okay? That was a right. big deal. And one great thing about the combination of like the Colt revolvers and then the Henry lever actions. A lot of time you're, you'll be able to change out your cartridges that you shoot in your pistol, like 45 Colt, into your carbine lever action. And so that way, if you were on someone on the frontier, you can't like go to the gun store and buy ammo for your pistol and buy ammo for your rifle. You just buy whatever ammo you could get. And if it works for both guns, that's even better. Yeah, I mean, looking at guns like the 1873 Winchester and a lot of the early Winchesters, which use yeah. the same... Uh, ammunition as a service revolvers and other revolvers people were carrying, it made a lot of sense to be able to keep the ammo continuity the same. So that was a big development in of itself. And like we said, there's so many people on this list that we could include, but we're trying to keep it a little bit, um, you know, closer to w what we have here. For Benjamin Tyler Henry, you know, one of the, the biggest um, aspects of Henry was that he really developed one of the first viable and, and mass producible repeating rifles. Uh, in the Henry, uh, yep. original Henry. I mean, you've probably seen him with the brass frame <laughs> and, you know, the, the Yankee rifle that you could load on Sunday and shoot all week. Exactly. Um, that was a big deal back then. Uh, a, a firearm that not only was a repeater, didn't require loading from the muzzle, right. didn't require percussion caps. It was a cartridge-contained rifle that you could load multiple shots in, and it, you, it was an easy repeater, easy to shoot, reasonably good power. It was a lot less power than the service muskets at the time. However, the repeatability and be able to get fast follow-up shots was a very important aspect in firearms development at the time. So Benjamin Tyler Henry is definitely on this list along with right. uh, Samuel Colt. Richard Gatling, okay, so yeah. talk about the Gatling guns a bit. The Gatling gun, like that really revolutionized how warfare was fought. By having a squad weapon where you have multiple guys 
using this device and just having control over such a huge expanse of land, being able to rotate the gun and just sweep entire battlefields, that's unheard of. Normally, if you had muskets, you would have to line up, I don't know, 20, 30 guys in a line to cover that much area versus the, what, four guys it would take to run it. That's well, with impressive. the Gatling gun, you also deny. They had the ability with the Gatling gun to deny the enemy uh, his ability to occupy a certain amount of space because yeah. you just, by, through sheer firepower, you know, a lot of people associate uh, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt with winning <laughs> on San Juan Hill and 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 taking the objective that day, but not enough gets said for the Gatling guns that were brought in to help him take that objective. Mm. Okay, so the Gatling guns. Uh, really proved that the volume of firepower was necessary to control an objective and to control a battlefield situation, which gave way. All right, so now we're moving along. And the Gatling yep. gun was a great invention. So number two on our list, those first men on that initial uh, spot we felt needed to occupy that one spot, beginning on number two, Hiram Maxim. Yeah. Okay, so Hiram Maxim attended the World's Fair, <laughs> and he was going around, he was trying to sell a mousetrap, okay, uh, not a lot of people know that about Hiram Maxim, and this is this is know. something Barry told me about Hiram Maxim. So he went to the World's Fair trying to sell a mousetrap, and this guy was like, "Look, man, if you want to make a ton of money, you don't need to to develop a mousetrap. You need to develop a better, more efficient way for these Europeans to slaughter each other." Jeez. So <laughs> therein there became the Maxim machine gun, and um, the Maxim family. I, I later found out that. It wasn't Hiram Maxim that developed the Maxim suppressors. It was his son, I believe. It was one of his kids, oh, I think, okay. later on down the line. I don't think it was actually Hiram Maxim that developed some of the early Maxim suppressors. Um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was actually really, really into using suppressors on a lot of his lever action rifles, and he used some early Maxim suppressors um, on his hunting rifles. So the Maxim family in general was really, you know, uh, responsible for not only early machine gun development, but also early suppressor development. So that's a pretty important step. Absolutely. You know, taking a battlefield, they thought that World War I was gonna be the war to end all wars. They thought that by the time they, they introduced these horrible, horrible, yeah. deadly weapons to the battlefield, that everybody would drop their weapons and they would never wanna fight a war ever again. And Hiram Maxim struck that fear into everybody with the Maxim machine gun, and then also, the, the doctrine of suppressor use was something the Maxim family was, was really uh, directly responsible for as well. So that's, that's a pretty big undertaking. And Not only machine guns, but suppressors too. Still around today. You know, the whole suppressor right. concept is just yep. such a fantastic opportunity to quiet down and suppress that explosion that goes on from shooting a gun. You know, it, it's hard to beat anything like that. You know? Agreed. I think from a military perspective, they were looking to hide the position, yeah. and and that's a very important aspect. I mean, in modern modern suppressor use, most folks are really concerned about just trying to save their hearing, uh, not have to wear ear, hearing protection. Hearing protection, I'm sorry. Uh, or for a hunting situation, if you're going to fire a couple shots at an animal, it it helps to not disturb the surrounding area. Um, so there's a lot of uses that suppressors have: uh, self defense, home defense, all of those types of things. So. Hiram Maxim definitely an important name in the firearms engineer world because he paved the way for a lot of really interesting things. Right. Now, Hiram Maxim's, I guess you could say John Browning was technically a contemporary of Hiram Maxim. They I were, would say so. You know, so number three is obviously John Browning. And Good man. <laughs> yeah, you, you cannot talk about firearms engineering and folks designing firearms until you talk about John Browning. So. Right. I know you know about John Browning's designs a lot. Oh my gosh, that guy has something like 120 designs. His first one, he was 15 years old when he first came out with his first patent. And it's just, it boggles my mind. When I was 15 in high school, like, yeah, sure, I could sketch something up. I, I wouldn't have the capacity to like, oh wait, this is actually like a patentable idea. Let me go out and go through all the steps that it takes to go through the whole patent process, searching patents, figure out Hey, has this already been made? Does someone already have a patent on this? And then applying for it, it's just yeah, really impressive. Well, to be fair though, you know, the thing about John Browning is that he was, I want to say what, like a third or fourth generation gunsmith. Hmm. So he came from a long line of gunsmiths in terms of his family. So it was kind of in his blood, uh, gunsmithing, uh, not hmm. only you know modifying and fixing existing guns, but designing new guns was something that was definitely not an unfamiliar thing to the to the Browning family. 
And John Browning is responsible for probably some of the most iconic and recognizable firearms designs that even hold true today. I mean, you look at the 1911, yeah. you look at the Browning 1919, the Ma Deuce machine gun, <laughs> which is still in use today. Okay, uh, the Ma Deuce is still in use. It's still around. There's so many Browning shotguns, like the uh, you know the 18 1897 and the A5 and, and the yeah the A5 yeah. and the A18 what there's a what 1887. There's a couple of oh, different. Oh yeah, that lever action yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. So there's like yeah. the knuckle buster, which is a slam fire right. shotgun, like the trench gun that he developed, yep. and then also the lever action shotguns he developed. So there's some really interesting engineering going on. Many sure. um, gun designs, which he ended up selling to Winchester, and he also sold gun designs to Colt, obviously. Yeah. So you know, he was the kind of guy that would design something. And I mean, I've, I've actually got several Winchester rifles in here, which many of them were designed by John Browning. So, yeah. such a genius man, and so many of his technologies that he developed and these ideas that were just floating around in this man's mind <laughs> have been continued on and integrated into right. firearms that we see today. Right, and come back to the point about his family being a whole line of gunsmiths, it definitely sounds like he had the tools then. If he had the mind already, you know, he could go into the shop and like, hey dad, hey grandpa, can you help me whip up this idea? Like that helps so much to be able to actually make the parts in versus just like sketching it out. Because you can have the best idea on paper, but if you can't make it, it's not a good idea. I would like to think that that was something he would have had access to. I'm, yeah. I'm sure, you know, he would have went and asked a family member or something. So, right. you know, such a genius man and uh, and such an entrepreneur. And to me, John Browning is, is the embodiment of the entrepreneurial spirit of America. You know, just getting in there and making cool things and trying to make a living, and it's just such an awesome thing. So John Browning is definitely on this list. All right, so going on a little bit more chronologically here, uh, Mikhail Kalishnikov, okay? Yep. Y you really can't discuss gun development without discussing Kalishnikov. Now, there are other Russian firearms designers that are of equal merit. Uh, okay, you look at um, the, you know, the guy that designed the SVD, which I can't remember his name off the top of my head, and then the guys that designed uh, Simonov that designed the SKS. Yeah. There are many other... Russian firearms designers that are totally worth mentioning. But Kalishnikov really did some amazing stuff with the AK. He developed, you know, one of the first truly mass-produced intermediate cartridge firearms using, uh, you know, milled receivers. And it's just such an awesome concept back then to come right. up with that. Now, there's some arguments as to you know how much design aspects or how many ideas he might have taken from guns like the Sturmgewehr. Um, Kalishnikov was a tank commander during World War II, and he scratched up some of the rough drawings for the AK while he's wounded in the hospital. Wow. He was taken from the front, and he was wounded, and he wanted to develop or start development of an infantry rifle or a replacement infantry rifle that would serve his country and protect his homeland. And that was his initial uh, you know thought process there. And of course, I think that they took some cues from the Sturmgewehr being an intermediate eight millimeter cartridge. They took that idea and just scaled it for their 7.62 to be able to use an intermediate cartridge. Um, it didn't really have the range and punch of a standard infantry rifle like the Mosin the Gant. However, um, by increasing the capacity of the magazines, making the, the firearm select fire and semi-automatic, also by simplifying the design and giving it just a very driven and direct purpose, um, it was a very reliable and robust system and has held true today. I mean, For sure. uh, the Kalishnikov is still a produced gun today. They're out there. They've held up. Even a lot of the old yeah. original guns are still floating around on battlefields to this day. Like I might even say they are, in the global sense, they have to be one of the most iconic firearms because I think there's like I don't know, two nations that have uh, AK on their national flag. That says something right there. If your design is up on a country's flag, that's, that's well, pretty wild. Well, you know, it, it was a gun that was built by a common guy for yep. common people to use. I mean, it, it, was, it was just simple. You know, you take the rifle, you, you charge it, you look down the sights, you line these things up, you squeeze the trigger, the bullet goes there. It, you could train a man on how to use it in no time. Yep. It was a gun that could be given to a conscript, send him out to war, and it was a functional tool that would work and do the job. And exactly like in it. the Vietnam War, you know, we found out fighting the Viet Cong, who were armed primarily with these types of firearms, that the guns fared really well for jungle use. Um, the rounds punched a lot better through lots of light brush in the jungle than our fast rounds that came out of our, which we're about to get to another firearms yep. designer. 
Um, but we found that, you know, they were a formidable enemy when armed with this weapon, when even at the time we considered ourselves to have a much, much superior gun to theirs. For sure. Um, it, it really held true even up through modern conflicts. It is a force to be reckoned with, the AK-47. So yep. Mikhail Kalishnikov, in my opinion, really belongs on this list because he, he really made a, a mass-produced gun that was inexpensive to make and prove that infantry rifles did not have to be complicated and it didn't have to be kind of crazy and full featured. It could be simple, robust, and really do the job. Right. All right. Eugene Stoner is the next one. So what you want to talk about Eugene Stoner a little bit? Oh, let's see. I would really pair him, even though he came after um, Kalishnikov, you know, just because the conflict between AK and AR, we still talk about it today. There's still videos of like, what's more reliable? What can do better long range? You know, it's such a impressive concept of coming up with the uh, M16 and the Stoner 63 yes. machine gun. Yeah, it's just the M16 obviously variants are still around today as we have here and there. Yep. Yeah, th this is a Brownells um, XM177 yeah. Retro. So this is a modern replica of the original, you know, Colt carbine that would, you know, would have been a very early issue style of AR. And where where Eugene Stoner really went forward in terms of firearms manufacturing and why a lot of his concepts hold so important today is because he re really revolutionized the use of the most advanced materials that they could use at the time, using mm -hmm. aircraft-grade aluminums to keep the weight down, using direct gas impingement, and using this, this contained bolt mechanism, and just all of these things that were really unique for the time. Right. Um, you know, being able to use plastics. Yeah. You know, if you would have asked an infantry big. soldier, yeah. if, you, if you took an infantry soldier from 1899, and you put him in a time machine, <laughs> and you warped him to when this gun was developed, he would look at it and be like, what is this abomination? Right. This is not a rifle. This, is, this isn't real. Like, he wouldn't understand polymers and plastics yeah. and using, you know, glass-injected plastics, you know, yeah. using bacolite and all of these odd materials. But Eugene Stoner realized the importance of not only saving weight, but also the strength of these materials, the limitations of these materials, and what these materials needed to do, and realize you don't have to have some solid metal part that is is not an incredibly important part. It could be lightweight. Right. It really uh, was a step forward from the classics of like having a Garand and then an M14, like the big heavy rifles. This guy's lights, short, small. You know, you could carry it around no problem, and it was just easy to deploy. And I think that's. One of the big things that came out of Vietnam is just having such close quarter combat. You needed something like, you know, it's kind of not necessarily developed for the war, but it just fit in perfectly in the time frame. Well, there were some politics that were going on there for sure mm. with the Air Force and all of that stuff. But Eugene Stoner, definitely a genius. Yep. And really, if the politics wouldn't have got in the way with the M16 project and with the, with the ARs as we know them now, uh, you know, our, the, the Stoner 63 might have been a more widely issued uh, firearm uh, had the politics not gotten in the way. The Stoner 63 was probably one of the best class guns of that era, of that day. If you were a soldier in Vietnam and you were issued a Stoner 63, you had the most advanced and wonderful, awesome, awesome <laughs> infantry rifle you could ever ask for. They were awesome and the I troops agree. loved them. Still are. Yep, and they still are. Okay, now the, now we're going to get into our wild card for this Five Guns video. Yeah. So um, we, we've discussed a few, and I know that we jumped around and we added some people in here, which is a little bit outside the wheelhouse of the way we normally do it. Yeah. But every five, five Guns, in this case Five Designers video, has a wild card. The wild card for this video is Ronnie Barrett. That's for sure. Okay, Ronnie Barrett is a pretty important person to think about when it comes to firearms development. Why? Well... He was the guy that was told, you can't make a shoulder fired 50 cal and still have a person on the, the user end being able to function and fire again. There he goes. He yep. did it. Yep. Now, Prove them wrong. Now, this is a 107. Um, the, the gun that, that Ronnie initially developed was, was loosely, or I guess officially known as the M82. Uh, the 107 is a little bit lighter weight. 
and modernized version of the M82, but the basic concept is still there. Right. A man portable um, 50 cal, yep. semi-automatic 50 caliber. <laughs> now, the reason that it's important is for one, somebody told him he couldn't do it and he did anyway. Yeah. So that's important. It really shows the, the spirit of American ingenuity. Someone tells you you can't do something and you go, you know what, the heck with this person, I'm gonna do it. Absolutely. And then the military going, holy crap, this is the <laughs> coolest thing ever. And yes, then what sir. do they do? Oh, we want them now. Yeah. So really just looking at adversity in the face and saying, screw you, I'm gonna do it anyway. And there's nothing more American, nothing more uniquely American than Ronnie Barrett's story in the Barrett yeah. family. And I love Barrett Firearms, and I love my 107. My wife, at one point, she said, uh, Eric, I'm going to buy you any gun you want. What do you want? I said, I want the 107. This, this was my bucket list gun. Wow. Because th like, this was just the gun to me. Yep. When I think shoulder-fired American freedom, like, man, it's just, yeah. Yeah, and that, going back to Ronnie's story of being told, no, you can't do this, it, won't, it can't be made. That's what I love so much about this rifle. You know, coming into the firearm industry uh, career market, I would say, you know, you look at a whole bunch of old guns, you look at Hiram Maxim, John Brown, and you're like, all right, all the good designs are taken. No, they aren't. There's still that possibility to be a creative engineer, think outside the box, come up with something that has never been done before. Yep, to, to, to identify a problem yep. and create a solution. And even if somebody tells you you can't do it, never be afraid to try to track down a solution uh, or solve an issue. And that's all Mr. Barrett wanted to do. He, he, they told him he couldn't do it, so he wanted to do it. And he <laughs> provided a solution that the military wanted a man portable 50. They just didn't think it could be done. So his country needed it, and he made it. And I think it's just such an awesome thing. And it goes to really prove the, the concept that if you don't give up, and you really, you know, really try hard for your dreams. I mean, like this, this gun is living proof that you can really chase your dreams if you if you look hard enough. And I think that gives a lot of people hope. You know what I mean? Yep. And let's face it, throwing big old uh, fifty cal <laughs> rounds down range is definitely, definitely a fun thing. Oh to yeah, do. absolutely, can't beat it. All right, we're gonna go down the list now. This is the end of the video. However, we do have some honorable mentions that we think that yeah. we, we would, we're probably going to be raided and, and tarred and feathered if we don't mention these people in this video. This is, this okay, is true. Okay, so we, we knew that if we didn't mention these <laughs> folks, you guys were going to hunt us down and murder us. Yeah. So these are our honorable mentions that make it in this video as well. So it's a wild card, wild card. So yeah. go down the list here. All right, David Carbine Williams. Okay, David Carbine Williams. Uh, nickname Carbine Williams. He was known for making the tappet system used in the M1 carbine, the self-contained tappet gas system uh, that they used to make the M1 carbine. Pretty important thing. Um, it, that tappet type of system is used in, in various firearm designs. It's a pretty smart idea. And he developed it, what, in prison? A lot of people don't know that. So I didn't he, know that. He, he, wow. he developed that in the prison shop, huh. in, the, in the machine shop in prison. Impressive. Yep. Good thing made the list. All right, John C. Garand. Yeah. That's pretty obvious there, yeah. guys. The M1 Garand was a very, very awesome and revolutionary idea for the time, and it put America right up front in World War II for having a special and wonderful class of infantry rifle that you could not ask for a better infantry gun at the time. No, you really can't. I mean, and I've shot the Garands in uh, some service rifle competitions. It's still such a cool gun to just spend a day at the range shooting because you know the history that's involved with the design and with the person that made it, you know? Love pretty it. dang cool. cool I, I, it's, it, it's worth mentioning a guy like Garand because he's just such a genius. Okay. Yep. Uh, the Mauser brothers deserve an honorable mention. Obviously, uh, Paul and Wil Wilhelm, Willihem, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Wil <laughs> William. Can't you just spell it William? But anyway, <laughs> Paul and William Mauser, basically. Yep. Um, it, it's hard to talk about firearms development and not mention the Mausers. Right. Because, man, I mean, they developed one of the first commercially viable semi-automatic pistols that was issued widely to militaries and mass-produced around the world. They also developed one of the most uniquely distinctive actions, uh, rifle actions, that you could ever ask for. And one of the strongest yeah. It is very strong. Mauser actions have been used in countless yeah. sporting rifles, 
um, military rifles. It's been copied yeah. and changed. I mean, the, the basic concept of the Mauser action rifle is probably one of the most distinctive and important firearms developments. For sure. It's just so widespread throughout the market and like Winchester's make them, you know, Ruger still has some rifles with Mauser actions. It's mm -hmm. just everywhere. Yeah, and, and also the control feed of the Mauser action, yep. very important. You know, the rifle could be worked from any angle, laying down sideways, and that control feed makes sure it was a very reliable feed of every single round. Yeah. Pretty genius for, you know, just before the turn of the century, pretty important uh, development of firearms, okay? The last but not least, Bill Ruger. Okay. He's a good I, guy. <laughs> I, think, I think it's important to have Bill Ruger on this list because he really did come up with some interesting innovations and yeah. not only like taking some of these classics and, and modernizing them a little bit, but also the way that he marketed and, and really marketed his inventions and put them out there was just a really next level and smart idea. And it's kind of like a good way to round off the list of, we have a lot of military service rifles. This guy did consumer, consumer goods, there we go. And so that was like a good way to bring everything in. Like, yeah, we have the military, they use this, it brought into the commercial market. And now this guy in the modern times kind of closes things all up. Well, I mean, there's a lot of like kind of quirky little engineering things that Bill Ruger did that were pretty interesting too. When you mm -hmm. look at, I mean, like there's the old story that Barry used to tell me all the time that he would he took like Savage Model 1899s and converted them to some automatics. Yeah. Things like that. He would take a <laughs> lot of these odd quirky things and and, and turn him into uh, his, his little brain children. So, you know, Ruger, if he did anything, he almost revolutionized the way a gun company yeah. is ran, like, in a way. Like, he sort of set the standard for how gun companies do business from a business perspective. He yep. was a good businessman. He saw the importance of marketing and putting products out there and, and providing something that's familiar yet kind of new and, and given new life again. Right. And, and doing that in right. a way that makes people go, wow, this is cool, you know. Yep, for sure. Pretty special, in my opinion. So, guys, thanks for watching today's video. Uh, we really appreciate it. I know this video was kind of long, but we thought this would be something cool and kind of semi-educational, uh, but also a Five Guns video. And this was great talking points for Remington here. Um, yeah. So where can they find you online if they want to follow you? So you can follow me on Instagram at Little Remington. I post a lot of uh, hunting photos, outdoor photos in general. I do some hiking and canoeing up at college. A lot of just outdoorsy kind of content. It's good That's stuff. Right. Yeah, man. So any plans for the future? What you got going on next? Um, so I'm going into my senior year of mechanical engineering at Clarkson University. Uh, like you said it earlier in the video, I'm interning at Ruger for the summer. Um, in their engineering department doing some manufacturing stuff there. Nice. After this year, look for a full-time job. Cool, man. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we always like having Remington down. <laughs> Thanks for watching today's video, guys. We graciously appreciate all of you. If you consume this content and you enjoy it and you love it, consider you know pledging a few bucks on Patreon or buying a man can to help support our efforts. All of those funds go directly back in to being able to put this content out for you guys. We really, really appreciate all of our supporters that support our channel financially because all those funds we get guys go right back into making things happen. You guys are great. Thank you so much for your patronage and for your support. Thank you for watching today's video. We'll see you next time. Take care.